RFK Jar wants these nine foods bandied in your kitchen. When I first heard that headline, I paused. It's rare for a public health initiative to make people look twice at the food on their shelves. Yet, that's precisely what this statement from Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has done. It's bold, provocative, and deeply relevant. As a physician and researcher, I find it both fascinating and important to unpack, because behind this statement lies a growing scientific concern. Not about one ingredient or one brand, but about how modern food chemistry has evolved far beyond what our biology ever expected. Today, I want to take you inside this conversation, calmly, scientifically, and fairly, so we can understand what's driving these proposed bans, what the evidence really says, and what this means for your health, your kitchen, and your future. Kennedy's campaign to ban or phase out nine foods, or rather, nine categories of ingredients, isn't just about politics or nutrition labels. It's about public trust in food safety and the growing tension between industry innovation and biological integrity. The nine items under scrutiny include synthetic food dyes, titanium dioxide, brominated vegetable oil, potassium bromate, high fructose corn syrup, processed seed oils, ultra processed foods, artificial sweeteners, and a broader category of additives such as BPA and PFAS. Chemicals that leach from packaging, or are granted, generally recognized as safe, status without thorough testing. Each of these represents a piece of the puzzle. How our food has become increasingly artificial, colorful, and convenient, but perhaps at a cost we're only now beginning to understand. Let's start with the first one, synthetic food dyes. These bright pigments. Red 40, yellow 5, yellow 6, blue 1, blue 2, green 3, are made from petroleum. They're used to make candy, soda, cereal, even vitamins look appealing. In the 1970s, they were considered safe, largely because the doses used were small compared to levels that caused harm in animals. But modern studies have taken a second look. In controlled trials, researchers observed that children with behavioral sensitivities, particularly attention deficit symptoms, may experience worsening behavior when consuming artificial dyes. The European Food Safety Authority now requires warning labels on products containing certain dyes. Some countries have phased out the most problematic ones entirely. The United States still allows them, but the scientific discussion is shifting. Kennedy argues that if there's even a small risk, especially for children, and the benefit is only cosmetic, making food look brighter, then why keep them at all? It's a question rooted not in fear, but in a precautionary principle. Now, titanium dioxide. It's a white pigment used to make candy coatings shiny, to make sauces opaque, to make chewing gum bright. Chemically, it's the same compound used in sunscreen and paint, but in food grade form, it's milled into ultrafine particles. The concern is that these nanoparticles may penetrate biological barriers, accumulate in tissues, and trigger oxidative stress or inflammation. The European Union has banned its use in food entirely. The United States still permits it. The FDA maintains that it's safe at low levels, but researchers continue to investigate its long-term impact, particularly in the gut. In 2022, a group of toxicologists published a paper showing that titanium dioxide can alter gut microbiota and gene expression in intestinal cells. Kennedy's position here is that our understanding of nanomaterials in the body is too immature for us to declare this compound harmless. He's calling for a ban until proven otherwise. A reversal of the usual regulatory burden where chemicals are presumed safe until proven dangerous. Then we come to brominated vegetable oil or BVO. This is a stabilizer used in citrus flavored sodas to keep the flavor evenly distributed. The brominated Part refers to the addition of bromine atoms to the oil molecules. Bromine, chemically related to iodine, competes for the same receptors in the thyroid gland. High exposures can interfere with thyroid function and neurological health. Animal studies have shown that brominated compounds can accumulate in tissues over time. Europe, Japan, and India have banned it for years. The FDA recently proposed its own ban, citing evidence of bioaccumulation and toxicity. Kennedy is simply accelerating what scientists already recognize as overdue. Potassium bromate is next. This one's found in bread and baked goods, 
used to improve dough texture and help it rise. Once again, the word bromate signals trouble. The International Agency for Research on Cancer classifies potassium bromate as a possible human carcinogen. Studies in rodents link it to tumors in the kidney, thyroid, and other organs. Many countries, including the UK, Canada, and Brazil, prohibit it outright. In the United States, it remains allowed under the assumption that baking converts it to harmless bromide. However, analyses of baked products have found residual bromate in some cases. Kennedy wants to remove it entirely from the supply chain. His reasoning bread doesn't need a chemical oxidizer to be nutritious, and if even trace levels of a potential carcinogen can be avoided, why not eliminate them? Then there's high fructose corn syrup, AFCS. This one is controversial because it sits at the intersection of metabolism and economics. It's cheaper than sugar and used in almost everything sodas, sauces, baked goods, condiments. In the 1980s, its introduction coincided with the rise of obesity and type 2 diabetes in the United States. Correlation doesn't always mean causation, but mechanistic studies give reason for concern. Unlike glucose, fructose is metabolized almost entirely in the liver where it can drive fat synthesis, elevate triglycerides, and promote insulin resistance. Clinical research shows that diets high in fructose can contribute to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Kennedy's stance is that we've turned sugar into a hidden industrial commodity, and the health costs are showing up decades later. The counterargument, of course, is that total sugar consumption, not just HFCS, is the real culprit. Still, by targeting the ingredient most symbolic of ultra-processing, he's forcing an important conversation. Seed oils come next, another lightning rod in nutrition science. These include soybean oil, corn oil, sunflower, safflower, and canola. They're extracted under high heat and pressure, often with chemical solvents. They're rich in omega-6 fatty acids, particularly linoleic acid. Some researchers argue that excessive omega-6 relative to omega-3 intake promotes chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, and metabolic imbalance. Others argue that these oils lower LDL cholesterol and reduce heart disease risk compared to saturated fats. Both sides can point to solid studies. Kennedy isn't calling for an outright ban on all vegetable oils. He's focusing on the highly refined industrial versions that dominate processed foods. His argument is about balance and quality. The modern American diet supplies 10 to 20 times more omega-6 than omega-3. Historically, it was closer to 1 to 1. That shift, he says, has consequences for cell membranes, immune signaling, and vascular health. I think this is one of those areas where the science is nuanced. The problem is not the oil itself, but the context of the diet. When most calories come from processed foods fried in seed oils, Something fundamental about our metabolism changes. Ultra-processed foods, or UPFs, are a category unto themselves. The term refers not just to factory-made meals, but to products engineered from refined ingredients, starches, sugars, seed oils, emulsifiers, flavor enhancers, colorants. Their hallmark is convenience and hyper-palatability. Epidemiological studies have linked high consumption of ultra-processed foods to obesity cardiovascular disease, depression, cancer, and all, cause mortality. Even after adjusting for calories and nutrients, the associations persist. In controlled feeding trials, when participants eat diets rich in ultra-processed foods, they consume more calories and gain more weight, even when the meals are matched for macronutrients. Why? Because ultra-processing changes texture, speed of digestion, and reward signaling in the brain. Kennedy's goal is not to ban all ultra-processed foods. That would be impossible, but to phase them out of institutional settings like schools and hospitals, where vulnerable populations rely on government-supplied meals. In his view, feeding children the cheapest, most artificial food possible is a moral failure. Artificial sweeteners are another target, aspartame, sucralose, saccharin, asulfame, potassium, the FDA, EFSA, and WHO have all reviewed their safety repeatedly. Yet, emerging data suggest that these compounds might alter gut microbiota and glucose metabolism in subtle ways. A 2022 study in Cell found that some individuals experience impaired glucose tolerance after consuming certain sweeteners mediated by changes in gut microbes. 
Epidemiological studies also link high artificial sweetener consumption to increased cardiovascular risk, though confounding factors remain. Kennedy's position isn't that these sweeteners are immediately toxic, but that their long-term metabolic effects deserve re-evaluation. He's calling for stricter limits, especially in products marketed to children. Finally, we have a broader class of chemical contaminants. BPA, PFAs, and other so-called forever chemicals. These aren't ingredients we intentionally add for flavor or color. They're part of packaging, coatings inside cans, linings in bottle caps, waterproof films on paper containers. BPA mimics estrogen and can disrupt hormonal signaling. PFAs, used for grease resistance, persist indefinitely in the environment and bioaccumulate in the body. Studies have linked them to immune suppression, reduced fertility, thyroid dysfunction, and certain cancers. Kennedy's team wants to close the regulatory loopholes that allow thousands of chemicals to enter the food supply without comprehensive testing. Today, many substances are labeled, generally recognized as safe, based on limited industry data. The call here is for full transparency and independent review, not automatic trust in corporate declarations. When you step back, a pattern emerges. The foods on Kennedy's list aren't essential nutrients. They're additives. Chemicals used to make food prettier, cheaper, longer, lasting, or more convenient. From a nutritional perspective, they offer no value. From a public health perspective, their safety profiles range from uncertain to questionable. And yet, they're everywhere. As a physician, I understand the logic of starting here. If we can remove the most unnecessary and potentially harmful substances, we can improve the food landscape without asking people to change their diets overnight. But to be balanced, we must also acknowledge the challenges. Regulation is slow and contentious. The science is evolving and the dose makes the poison. Many of the studies showing harm involve high exposures in animals, not real world consumption levels in humans. Moreover, Food reformulation has unintended consequences. Remove artificial preservatives and shelf life shortens. Remove dyes and consumer acceptance drops. Ban seed oils and manufacturers switch to saturated fats, potentially raising cardiovascular risk. Every action has trade-offs. That's why scientific nuance matters. Kennedy's list is provocative not because it's wrong, but because it forces us to weigh safety, practicality, and evidence all at once. The broader question is philosophical, should we wait for irrefutable proof of harm before acting, or should we act on credible suspicion when the potential stakes are high? The European model tends to favor precaution. Better safe than sorry. The American model tends to favor freedom and evidence-based regulation. Kennedy's approach leans toward the European side, emphasizing precaution in children's foods, public institutions, and mass market products where exposure is widespread. If we think historically, every major food reform began this way. Trans fats were once considered safe. They were even recommended in the mid-20th century. Then came decades of research showing they increased cardiovascular mortality, and today they're nearly banned worldwide. Lead was once used in cans and gasoline, Artificial dyes, brominated compounds, and plasticizers could be the next frontiers in that same story. Science evolves, and policy must evolve with it. As I reflect on this, I see Kennedy's initiative as both a political statement and a scientific conversation starter. It's less about banning nine foods overnight and more about redefining what safe really means in the modern food era. The truth is, our biology hasn't changed in 10,000 years, but our food chemistry has changed dramatically in the last hundred. We now eat molecules that no human cell had ever encountered until a few generations ago. Some are harmless, some beneficial, and some, perhaps, subtly harmful over decades of exposure. That's what makes this discussion so crucial. So, what should you do as a consumer? You don't need to wait for a government ban to make informed choices. You can start today by minimizing exposure to these controversial ingredients. Read labels for synthetic dyes. Choose drinks without brominated oils. Opt for breads labeled bromate-free. Limit processed snacks high in seed oils and added sugars. Choose naturally sweetened foods when possible. And don't panic. 
Small exposures are not immediate poisons. Health is cumulative, just like risk. Every substitution, every home, cooked meal, every mindful purchase adds up. To me, the most inspiring part of this conversation is not fear, but opportunity. For decades, food has been designed for profit and shelf life. What Kennedy is challenging, and what science increasingly supports, is a return to food designed for health and vitality. That's a future worth striving for. As a doctor, I'll end with this thought. The call to ban these nine categories isn't really a call to take away your freedom. It's a call to reclaim the integrity of what we call food. Real nourishment doesn't need colorants, bromates, or fluorinated coatings. It needs whole ingredients, balanced fats, natural sweetness, and transparency. Whether or not these bans succeed politically, the conversation they've sparked is essential. Because the next time you pick up a brightly colored snack or a bottle of soda, you might pause. Just long enough to ask, what exactly am I putting into my body? And if that pause leads even one person to make a better choice, if it leads industry to reformulate, regulators to review, and consumers to care, then maybe, just maybe, this entire debate will have been worth it.